So the standard frontline treatment is uh, for endometroid or serous tumors has been carboplatin paclitaxel. Uh, endometrial cancer is clearly a very heterogeneous disease. One of the rare histologies is carcinosarcoma. Um, uh, the traditional treatment has been unknown. So there was a study here at this meeting uh, from the NCI Energy GOG 261 Jubilee. Tell us about that. Yeah, gladly. Um, so Matt Powell presented this, uh, this information on GOG 261, which uh, looked at both ovarian and uterine carcinosarcomas. Um, it was a large study, over 600 patients enrolled with a primary endpoint of overall survival. And what this uh, trial did was to compare paclitaxel with ifosfamide and mesna, um, which you know, historically has been relatively toxic and difficult to administer, so not a lot of enthusiasm for giving that, to paclitaxel and carboplatin, which of course we have a lot of experience with. And interestingly, um, progression-free survival and overall survival were both uh, improved on the uh, paclitaxel and carboplatin, didn't reach significance, um, but the toxicity, of course, uh, was, as expected, worse with the ifosfamide-containing component. So really what this does is give us a new standard for paclitaxel and carboplatin. Thank God. And the and the, and the, <laughs> what did you say? Thank God. I hate ifosfamide. And, and the statistics were not inferior. Correct. So, Chris, does that change your treatment? It changed it a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> so you're already doing it? Well, when we designed the trial, you know, a lot of us, you know, these drugs are available, carboplatin and paclitaxel, and we could, you know, we definitely need the trial to validate these things, but the trouble with ifosfamide paclitaxel is, uh, you said, is it's difficult to administer, it's difficult to tolerate, so, yeah. The, so it's, it, it, it joins the uh, graveyard of intraperitoneal chemotherapy? Yep. Well, and, and, go. and it got, it, <laughs> exactly. you know, it got into this, it got into the treatment Primarily because IFOS was used for soft tissue sarcoma. Which this is really Which, an epithelial It's, it's not a sarcoma. Yeah, yeah. that's a yeah. great, that's great take home point. So we talked about the opportunity for pembrolizumab in mismatch repair deficient tumors. Probably the other biomarker other than mismatch repair deficiency is HER2. So tell us about HER2 testing and trastuzumab, Tom. Well, Brad, I think you said it well. If you look at cervical cancer, you're looking at PDL1, and, you, and you're looking at HER2 now. Now, with endometrial cancer, you're looking at MSI and, and HER2. And, and so there's been data um, that's been evolving. There's several abstracts at the SGO, a couple by Dr. Mahdi looking at cell lines, both in UPSC as well as uh, endometrioid, uh, showing an advantage uh, d despite what strategy you use uh, of um, uh, going after the overexpression, whether an antibody drug conjugate or more of a, a global inhibitor. Um, and that I think all this preclinical work has led to the recognition that a clinical trial was indicated and it was published. Uh, Amanda Nichols uh, Fader published it in JCO um, uh, in July of last year. And uh, just as a randomized phase two, 61 patients. Um, but it, it combined with carbopaclitaxel in uh, HER2 overexpressors, uh, UPSC, and it was eight versus 12.6 months in terms of the difference, was, which was For a trastuzumab. Yeah, which was a hazard ratio of 0 0.44. So by adding the trastuzumab, um, you re reduce the risk of uh, progression by you know, nearly 60%. So this is a big deal. Test your cervical cancer for pd one and EGF activating mutations like we talked about, and HER2 new overexpression or amplification, and MSI high in endometrial. So finally, we're getting, probably due to you, because you're the biomarker guru, finally we're getting biomarkers in our tumors. Yeah, it's going to help, clearly help the patients to maximize effect, uh, you know, the e efficacy of our drugs and minimize toxicity. Right. right. Yeah. So I want to talk about two final topics. One is adding a checkpoint to chemotherapy. Well, maybe we can do that now. Uh, Tom, is, is checkpoint being added to chemotherapy frontline? Because yeah, that's the idea, a right? number of trials out there. Um, it, it makes sense from preclinical rationale. The, the science is there to support it, and uh, we, we await the datum. And we have it with uh, atezolizumab and nabpaclitaxel in breast and platinum taxane in, in lung. So I like that. Tell me about, Michael, this idea that we can use anti-VEGF therapy to improve uh, IO. So the, the, the highest unmet need now in second line endometrial is those patients that are not mismatch repair deficient. So there's this whole idea that we can add anti-VEGF to Pembro. 
in the microsatellite stable group. That's right. So, I mean, I've, again, from a biologic standpoint, there's a lot of rationale to do that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, tumors have essentially, for lack of a better description, messed up vessels from uh, high levels of VEGF, uh, and that means that uh, immune cells can't necessarily traffic. So if you give uh, BEV and you normalize those vessels, then it's easier for the TILs to get access. VEGF itself is a very immunosuppressive agent. That's and, the point. Yeah, and we, we haven't really explored all that, but I think the, that those are the, the basis and the rationale for combining these two. I think in these settings, also, we know BEV is active, right, as a single agent. We also know IO is active, uh, maybe not as much in the stable group, although uh, we can debate that. Um, so, so for all that reasons, it, 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 it makes a lot of sense to do that. It may be that BEV isn't the best drug, maybe a TKI is. Well, to that yeah. point, so pembrolanvatinib yeah. is an opportunity where an oral anti-VEGF, anti-PDGF uh, with pembrolizumab, so that's being uh, studied in multiple tumor types, recently published in Lancet Oncology, was this uh, single arm phase two, and as Impressive. a result of it, got breakthrough designation. Yep. And so that now is being studied in a prospective fashion, second line endometrial, pembrolanvatinib versus physician's choice chemotherapy, which I don't know what second line treatment is in endometrial cancer, but in that study, weekly paclitaxel and doxorubicin. And then also being studied frontline in the chemotherapy uh, free option, carboplatin paclitaxel versus pembrolanvatinib. So I, 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 we were, you were talking about breakthrough designation. So we got breakthrough designation in the mismatched repair proficient endometrial group with pembrolinvatinib. You told me we got it till in cervical cancer just a few weeks ago. And then I was thinking, has it ever happened before? And the only other time we've had breakthrough is aerial two with recaparib. So breakthrough designation in both of those settings, the till and also in the pembrolinvatinib, again, doesn't guarantee uh, FDA approval, but facilitates it. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that's very, very interesting.